Get in the middle of a chain reaction. You get a medal when you're lost in action. Hello, my name's OD, and here I am introducing you to MCDM's chain reaction. I'm here with these two lovely people. This is Anna Lynn and Lars. So we got a bunch of questions from MCDM patrons, I believe they're called. Uh, I don't really know how that works, so Lars is gonna tell me a little bit about that before we kick off. So we put up a post on our Patreon that we launched with the stream, and uh, people who are patrons of us can go ahead and submit questions about the campaign, uh, about our characters, that kind of thing, and we're going to answer these questions, hosted by OD. Hello. Uh, all right, so we're gonna, we're gonna crack on, and we'll have a look at the first set of questions now. Uh, so the uh, first question is from Robert D. Smith, uh, formerly, actually he might still be the lead singer of The Cure, I'm not sure, but it's great to have Robert watching the stream. And uh, he wanted to know uh, what was the inspiration of the uh, Illrigger class and how much uh, input did you have into it? And I'm going to assume that question's to Anna because she's playing an Illrigger. Right, so the Illrigger class, which is um, what I'm currently playing as Judge, my tiefling character, is one that was custom created by Matt whenever I was first looking into playing kind of like a paladin character. Um, we were going through all the different oaths and everything, but because I wanted to play a tiefling, it didn't really feel like anything matched up. A tiefling? Yeah. So What's a tiefling? So a tiefling traditionally in D&D &D is this kind of like devilish looking character, usually with like red, purple, like dark hues of skin, horns, like cloven hooves for feet, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, usually not like well received in more traditional campaigns that are very like Arthurian, but uh, so they're in, in fact in Matt's campaign like they're pretty rare. Like I think only once before has somebody played like a tiefling character. Um, but because I like to be <laughs> contrary, I was like, oh man, I want to play a tiefling character. And whenever we started looking into uh, paladin classes and stuff, because there's tons of different oaths that you can choose from, and an oath is kind of what dictates the kind of paladin that they are. Uh, we weren't able to really find a singular oath that kind of matched everything together that I wanted Judge to have at his disposal. And so uh, whenever we kind of started realizing that, Matt decided he was going to create the Illrigger class. So you wanted to be a tea leaf, which isn't quite right, but we'll call it a tea leaf for sure. now, right? Yes. So which is kind of a devilly kind of guy, right. looking guy, yeah. right? Yeah. And then they're kind of associated with paladins, Right, this is I'm getting this right. Okay, tieflings are not oh, specifically. Okay. Tieflings are an ancestry that you can select from. Oh, I'm with so you. The same way, like a dwarf or a halfling, that kind of stuff, or an elf, half elf, whatever the case is. But you had this conversation with Colville, yeah, and from that conversation, he created a class. Yeah, because eventually, whenever we couldn't figure well, that's out, that's fucking cool, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't expect it. <laughs> right, and you I thought I was just gonna have to like mishmash uh, some paladin oaths together and like eh, maybe it'll work and maybe we'll call some stuff some different names. And he's like, "Fuck that! Why don't I just make you just you know, made it?" Class. And you found out about that. And that went into strongholds and followers. That class? No, but it is the PDF for the class. The PDF for the class is available just online. Uh, it's through our website where you can find it, where all the chain information's at. Just free to anyone just to free. use, just there it yeah. is, here's a it's, new It's class. still like very much like a pre-alpha kind of thing. Like he threw it together in order for us just to get the stream going and for me to have a character and be able to set up all my stats and everything. Bean would like to know, have you always been interested in D&D &D, or is it something that you had to warm up to? Uh, so I previously had no interest in D&D. &D. Uh, Matt found out that I had never played it when we were at Turtle Rock, and he kind of wrote me into it, and we went from there, and now we're here. I think for me, I think I was 16 at the time, and I found out that my friends were playing D&D, &D, and I think it was 3.5 if I remember. And I remember that I was like, oh, I want to I want to join it and I want to play. And so I played for like one session and I could tell that they were like not super, super thrilled about having a whole new person to have to worry about, like, because they had already gotten to like level four or five. Mm -hmm. And I came in and I had no idea what I was doing. So I was like, eh, okay. So I bounced off pretty hard. And then whenever I started working at a previous game company, um, there was a group playing Pathfinder. And so I joined their group and I played Pathfinder for like two years. So that was kind of my foray into uh tabletop RPGs, and I didn't really give a lot of thought to D&D &D until I joined Turtle Rock Studios, and I walked past the aquarium, and I think I saw everybody playing late one night, and I was like, what are those guys doing? And that looks like Pathfinder. And they're like, no, we're playing D&D. &D. And I was like, well, shit, I want to play some D&D. &D. And so eventually I hounded Matt, I think, long enough, and 
kind of inserted myself into one of the D&D games. Because uh, I think you guys had already started and played like a session or two. And then eventually I showed up. I invited her. You did? Yes. Back when we were good friends. That's now true. We're that's who changed. Now, now, we're, now we're friends. Now we're, yeah. Yeah, best, we're just best co-workers. Best. <clears throat> I think it's kind of the same thing happened to me, wasn't it? Like, Cole was like, you never played. I'll run a game for you one day. And he said that, what, a year ago or so? Two years probably now, thinking about it. Well, to be fair, we got a little busy. Yeah, then you got busy and all that, I know. And then suddenly we just go, right, we're going to do it. And it's like, oh, fucking hell, here we go. This is going to be a chore. And I was like, <laughs> and I don't, because the character sheet. Yeah, uh, it's like, intimidating. This is too much hard work. This is going to be no fun at all. And then he just, we all sat around a table and then he just went bang, right? And then he started doing it. And we're like, fuck, we're in it now. Off we go. And then it's like, well, just, I'm in now. Let's just see how it mm-hmm. goes. It was like, and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I think more than in you hound everybody to play now. Yeah, well, yes. I enjoyed it. And yeah, well, I mean, the group we're with a bit of a pain in the ass to organise, right? As I guess, so like, it seems to be Super the common common thing with loads of D and D groups. Yeah, right? yeah. Just Matt to, Matt had to hire his friends basically to play D and D with them right. to have a consistent schedule. Fuck. Jackson Anderson wants to know what are the biggest differences between this, the MCDM campaign, and the campaign you played while we were at Turtle Rock Studios. So the previous campaign was really open-ended. When we started, we had a lot of options of routes we could go. And as we pursued a path, the other enemies would get stronger. A lot of decisions. So we had to make a lot of decisions about what was going to happen or what we were going to tackle on how to keep all of these threats down and, you know, protect the region, et cetera. Um, When you say paths, like multiple choice, literally like you can go this way through a forest, this way through a cave, this way through... Yeah, think of it like a video game RPG where you come up and there's three paths you can go down. You're going to go for, you know, in our case, Calrel the Vile or Lareth the Beautiful or Bonebreaker Doricor, and we chose to go after Calrel the Vile. How did that work out? Uh, We defeated him, but Jess, Lady Serial, died. It's a shame. Yeah, well, she came back as a vampire queen and Matt ran her and thwarted Phil, the campaign that Phil was in for a long time with Lady Serial. Oh. Yeah. Serial killer, as it were. (laughs) Serial Serial. Well, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Eight. Uh, this next question is from Alexis Rungineer. I think I'd probably get that completely wrong. Uh, but he wanted uh, to ask Anna, what was the pitch that he, she gave to Matt uh, to describe what class that an Illrigger would be? Right. So the Illrigger class that I kind of envisioned was one that used a lot of similarities with paladins um, as far as like oaths and having like a god that you kind of followed. Uh, but I really like the spell slinging part of it too. So Matt came up with a class that married both of those ideas together. And he's got a tail which he can use like a monkey, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. A devil monkey. Is that kind of, <laughs> right? Is that your character? Are you a devil monkey? You in nailed this it. Right? 100%. And as a devil monkey. Yes. Okay, good. This next question is from Keith, and he wants to know how different is it between playing D&D as a hobby and now that you're doing it professionally? I mean, I wouldn't say either of us are professional at D&D. But, uh, Not even in real life, really. I don't, I don't think it's all that different. I mean, we already streamed previously. Um, we still basically do the same things, and there's cameras on, but we're just playing D&D. It's kind of like when we're playing code names. So I don't know if you feel differently about it. I think I do sometimes get like a little bit more nervous now that there's so many extra people watching, which can be kind of scary, um, especially for RP moments, because I feel like combat is pretty straightforward. Like once you understand your character's dynamics and your mechanics, you can just roll in there and do what you need to do. But when it comes to RP stuff, it's so open-ended that it can be a little intimidating. Yeah, and we're all learning our characters right now, so it's only going to get better. But Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you're learning your second character, right? Yeah, my second character. How did your first character go? Uh, there's a guy right there behind you. I don't know if we can see it, uh, but he crushed me and ate me. It's a shame. <laughs> oh, well, you know, right it happens. <laughs> Good try. At least I went and attacked the monster, unlike uh, another campaign. I think that's being shot right in here, where the party didn't want to go in the dungeon. What do you know about that? Uh, I don't know much about that at all. Oh, okay, uh, I'm not well. even sure what the name of it is. Um, <laughs> And certainly not OD&D, I don't think. Definitely not OD&D. We're all very and, brave adventurers. And that's spoilers, so, you know, someday you'll see it. He's a true adventurer. Wanku. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith also wanted to know, how do you handle the entire internet critiquing every little move that you two do? For me personally, I'm not super worried about it. Uh, I don't really interact with the internet a whole lot, as most of you have probably seen. I don't really Twitter too much or social media. Uh, Anna is the master of that sort of thing. I'm a little bit more active on it now, but 
people will know me and they're going to get used to me and I'm not too worried about it. I think for me, I try to, I, I do read almost everything. <laughs> like I've taken upon that burden to kind of see what people are talking about when it comes to the stream. And so if I see people kind of critiquing how we play, if it's not constructive, I kind of just keep moving. But I usually try to see if there's like eh, a little thing that I'm like, oh yeah, you know what, you're right. Like I could probably get better at understanding how this works. Like we actually did a whole weekend where we played, um, what was it, like uh, uh, combat exercises. Because a lot of us are playing brand new classes like, you know, Tom's never played before. And so a lot of us wanted to get better at combat so that would move a little more swiftly. And I, I, had think a, I, I, had a, I had a great time winding schmuck up before the stream started because he was uh, he was definitely a little bit nervous. And uh, so I worked with him and uh, every time I'll go over to his desk, I'm like, you'll be all right, mate, don't worry. It's only your first time playing with about 20,000. I think I upped it as well, 20,000 people watching. Don't worry about it. <laughs> It'll go fine. He's like, oh, stop it. <laughs> yeah, right, he was probably doing the old sweat thing. But, <laughs> I think he's doing all right. I think you're he's doing all right. Uh, Jill has a question for Lars and she wants to know, do you think you're ever going to see the commander again? And what will Matt do with him? So for the commander, I don't think so. Matt typically tends to reuse our dead characters or characters we're no longer playing in the campaign. But I think with us going to capital, we're going to be more focused on that. Maybe down the line, he might do something with it. But right now, I don't think so. And he got eaten. And he got eaten. I do have to keep emphasizing he did, that. He He's definitely got death. eaten. And it definitely wasn't a setup. Clayton B would like to ask this question to both Anna and Lars. What would you say influenced you to give your characters slash retainers their personalities? And how do you think they may change? Lars, I'm looking at you for that one. <laughs> All right, well, as far as changing, uh, spoilers. So that's not gonna happen, but <laughs> I really just made characters that I wanna play. Um, the commander obviously didn't get to see very much of them, but I set up a backstory about it. We talked about it a little bit in the uh, entry of the Chronicle, uh, but I like to play characters that are very tactically oriented and battle masters are that. So I chose that and he was a commander. And there we go. Dead characters is what you like to play. Uh, definitely dead characters, specifically characters that take less than one turn. So I tuned in to the first stream late. I was a bit late getting in yeah. and I get in there and you're, this is what I see. This is you. <laughs> I'm like, what's happened? And it was like, Lars is dead. Lars is dead. And so as I, as I understood it for that first stream, you just had to sit there being dead, like for the next two hours or whatever it was, right? Uh, you not, couldn't really do anything. You weren't a character, you were dead. Not completely. I got to interact with uh, these guys and give them advice and that kind of thing. But for the most part, I was dead, but that was the setup for the stream. That's it's what like we signed up for was the fall of the chain. And that's what we experienced was the fall of the chain. You did fall pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, the Got commander it. specifically fell pretty hard. Not you, not you. Fair enough. Your character. Well, no, but it's my character. Playing. I mean, I'm there too, but you know. You were rolling the old dice. Bad. Uh, well, no, I didn't really roll any dice. No, you did, you, <laughs> did you actually not get to roll one set of dice? Uh, I got to roll two attacks and a healing surge. How did that go? Uh, I mean, I hit both times. I love a nice healing surge. <laughs> I hit both times. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, Out of, I think, the four total hits we had on old Relg back there. And the old healing surge? <clears throat> That's not an attack spell. No, but who did you heal and who did you surge? My, my, it heals yourself. Oh, you surged yourself. He hasn't gotten to that level yet. Oh, okay. Are, you're not a fighter. No, but uh, I've, I've got... called action surge. He's actually. dabbled. I'm trying to think. It's been a long time since I actually created my character, so I can't 100% remember what influences were going on at the time that I made Judge. I think I knew that I wanted to play something weird because I'd been playing, I played Nasa. Nasa was a gold character, which is kind of like a barbaric human. And then I played Alejandro, who is a Riohan human, Riohan, Riohan human. And so for, for Judge specifically, I was like, okay, well, I've played humans before, but what's, what's weird? Like, cause we had a couple options where Matt told us we could what was it? It had to be like three out of five had to be humans, but the mm -hmm. other two could be weirdos. Yep. And I was like, well, I'm definitely gonna <laughs> take that up because I didn't know who else was gonna be a human or who else wanted to be something strange. Um, and just because I knew tieflings were pretty peculiar in his world, I was like, oh, I'll be a tiefling then I guess. And we, from there we kind of figured everything else out. Like he's in Halloween costume. No. No? A little bit. That's just what it looks like. The devil costume. If you went to a uh, Halloween party city, just a couple of, <laughs> Halloween horror nights. couple of days before Halloween, you're panicking. You haven't got a costume. That's the last one on the rack, isn't it? <laughs> it was 
my first choice. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, it's a good choice. Wow, well done. rude. Yeah, no, no, no. I love it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Raygan L asks, what were your impressions of the other players' characters? I think that's an open one to either one of you. Uh, for me, I really like Tom's character. It's a different type of hunter. You know, obviously Matt did some changes for it. Big Cat's super cool. You know, how often do you see a displaced beast, especially commanded by a goblin? It's I've really... never seen a displaced <laughs> you beast. You definitely not. But it's pretty interesting, and it's interesting why he's in the chain, and I think he's pretty cool. Uh, as far as in-game characters, I think Nails is really cool character-wise. For me personally, I don't think the Wild Magic Sorcerer is designed very well since it relies on the DM to call it the Wild Surge, and the DM already has a lot of stuff going on behind the screen, so it's really hard for them to also take into account a character-specific thing. But I think Matt's doing something interesting with it, so we'll see how it plays out. When uh, I saw Big Cat for the first time, I couldn't help but think of uh, He-Man. Uh, so the first versions of characters from other players was I thought Phil's character was awesome. Like, just the way he looked, he's obviously got like the Build a Butcher vibe, um, the Pugilist class is super cool. Like, I think the grit aspect of it is pretty interesting and also the haymakers and everything. Just like mechanically, the class sounds really cool. Um, obviously, I was pretty shocked to see Tom's character being a goblin on a displacer beast. I thought I was weird. Mm -hmm. And then that showed up and I was like, holy shit, that's cool. Uh, Nails is like too cool, essentially. And then whenever I saw your character, I was like, that's Sean Bean. Sean Bean, that's Sean Bean. When uh, we got a sneak preview of the <clears throat> intro uh, when we were doing OD and D, so like uh, Colby wanted to test it, and uh, so we saw all the characters coming up, and then when Lars, your one came up, and there's the drawing, I was just like, "That's just your fantasy, right? You're just like that, that's you, yeah." That's how uh, definitely less clothes though, more barbaric. Uh, a lot of midriff showing, like Chesty Jake, right? That's yeah, but just the know. general kind of demeanor of it, the hair. Flowing, mm -hmm. kind of like I'm, I'm in charge. Kind of look to it, you know. Well, I am in charge. I know. I could, I could see you. Well, now especially you're you. Especially with you. Chad Oviet asks, would you say that you have a favorite retainer at this point, or do you love all of your make-believe children equally? I don't think I have a favorite yet. Although I did like how Colville RP'd Two Shoes, which was pretty good because Two Shoes is definitely uh, like Goody Two Shoes. Yeah. I love yeah. that name. So Two Shoes is a definitely a goody Two Shoes, basically. She's kind of like, you know, likes to walk the straight and narrow and everything, doesn't really approve of Judge too much, so there's kind of like that dynamic and conflict there too. Um, I actually think I have like three, two or three more retainers that have not even like been revealed yet, and they're all pretty interesting as well. It's hard for me to pick a favorite, to be honest. I think Two Shoes, because she's gotten the most limelight so far, is pretty high up there though. So in this world of D&D, &D, you've got all these retainers as well. So you've got to manage your own character and your retainers as well. They have their own sheets. Uh, they, don't how have, this works? they don't have their own full sheets. It's all part of their own the, cards. Yeah. That's uh, actually like from a, Strongholds and Followers. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I didn't know. So you're kind of like, there's your sheet and then you manage your retainers just by cards and you say. And are, they, are those retainers from Strongholds and Followers? Just mm -hmm. directly from there and you chose. The classes are, but the classes like are, the, yeah. the characters themselves are something that we've created. Ah. So it's based on how much charisma you have because that implies that you have the leadership in order to kind of lead those retainers. You've got five retainers. <laughs> I think I have, have the most out of everybody. And so when you're in, so when you're playing, and I've, so when you're playing and you've, you're in combat, for example, can you then call on your retainers? Can that be like an action? You could just go, I want five of my retainers to go and rush that guy. If they were with you, theoretically, but so far they haven't been with us in actual Where combat. Where are they? Well, you can send them off to do other things for you, too. <clears throat> like, there's apparently other tasks that they can kind of take care of, so that way your main character is off doing the main thing, following the main storyline. So I had some high-level D&D. I struggled. With I, your own. I struggled, yeah. Yeah. I struggled just remembering my... What's the one I kept getting wrong all the time? What's your dex? Who? <laughs> Dex, what's that? Who's Dexter. Well, we're like level one, so. Level two now. We leveled. Well. Spoilers. Uh, maybe. Drew Dunn asks, have you ever thought at all about how your characters from the chain might interact with your previous characters from the last campaign at TRS? For those not familiar, TRS is Turtle Rock Studios where we all at one time worked together. And mm -hmm. now we're sadly separated. 
Uh, for me, I haven't thought about it a whole lot, but Sigurd could definitely interact with the chain. He's no fan of Ajax, as far as uh, our beloved Solar Wind Panel. Uh, I don't know how he would really come up, but Matt likes to use old characters. For example, the Baron to Dalrath is a old character. Nicodemus is our old friend EJ from the last campaign's old character. So he definitely does that, so we'll see if it comes up. But me personally, I haven't thought about it too much. Wind Panel. His name was Sailor Bear Mantle, but we always called him Solar Wind Panel or Balar Scare Mantle. Got it, got it. Did a bunch of different things based on if he was a dinosaur, casting lightning, etc. A dinosaur casting lightning. He could turn into a dinosaur, he's a druid. Mind blown. <laughs> I think for me, I've thought actually quite a bit about what happens if Judge and Alejandro cross paths. Alejandro was the previous bard that I had played. Um, I know Alejandro would be super thrilled to meet Judge because of Judge's stature in the chain and because he's kind of, well, I don't want to say anything too much. Uh, but J Judge doesn't have like a lot of patience for any of that kind of stuff. So I don't think Judge would be too keen on meeting him. I like barbs. I think I chose <laughs> Thanks, well. Thanks, Matt. I think I chose Thank well. I like playing with barbs. <clears throat> I like you barbs. You know you got baited, right? <laughs> I know. You got baited. Yeah, I think he did, right? Because he was no, like, oh, you, you shouldn't be. play that. That's he like absolutely a... absolutely got baited. And I'm like, I'm doing it now. <laughs> you got baited. He wanted you to play bars and you were barred. I love being a bard. Well, I'm glad you love it, but you got baited. I don't want to die. Well, <clears throat> uh, you're never going to die if you never go on an adventure. You can talk to Wes about that. Do you create intricate backstories for your characters or do you sketch out some basic ideas and let characters evolve as you play them? And that was a question asked by Jason to either one of you. But you know what? I know who loves a backstory. So I think we're going to let Anna answer this one first. Thanks, OD. So for Judge, I basically wrote out like a chapter from like a book uh, of what happened to him uh, for his backstory. In the past, I'd done like bullet point lists and everything. But what I found with bullet point lists is I tend to get like a little too crazy. <laughs> like I think Nasa had like a hundred different bullet points for weird character quirks that she had. And then whenever I actually started playing, I was like, there's no possible way I can introduce all of these. Like she'd, right. she'd be weird. But a, tra a chapter is still quite a lot of writing. Yeah, but, but you know, once you get into it, like it just kind of. How much did you write? How many pages? <clears throat> like three Google Doc pages. Three Google, uh, okay. So it's, it's not, not a lot. That's bad. Yeah. But the smallest font you could do, right? Yes. 6.5. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's a lot of writing. Well, yeah. yeah. Can you can you reveal anything juicy about his backstory that wouldn't uh, give away too many spoilers? A little secret tidbit? I don't think I should. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it depends on the level of the character. Um, the higher level, obviously, they need to have more that they've done in the past to kind of get them to that point. Uh, for King, for example, I had a kind of base storyline that he followed to kind of to get to where he is. But for me, I really like to interact with the world that the DM's presenting and kind of let the story build from there and kind of choose directions based on that as far as character development goes. I think as a, for myself, as a novice player, I, something I didn't even think about backstory at all. It was more like... None? Not so much, really. Like you it, was, in? it was more when a little bit when you're doing the character sheet, like yeah. oh, oh, what was my past? I was a criminal, but mm -hmm. that was it, right? And then, well, you and Jason figure out something. Right, cool. we come out with something cool for it in the end, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's more like the, it was so much. Here's a sheet. You got to do all this stuff. Like, oh god, I can't think about a character. But then I guess you guys, because you were preparing for a uh, for this for the stream, you had a lot more time to like. I guess, what was the word I could use here? Percolate your characters, right? Like a good coffee. Percolate your coffee, right? <laughs> but you spend time with them, right? You see what I mean? Yeah. At level one, you don't really need to have a huge backstory because you're going to be going through the adventure and that's kind of your character's That's bullshit. Experience. Have as much backstory as you want. Have backstory. all the backstory. Especially for a new player, you can come to the table with your character. You don't have to spend two years doing it and you can figure out what you want to do in the world. Right. Like a level one person is basically just you know, kind of a common person in the world. They haven't done anything. They don't have any great feats that they've achieved. You're level one. At level three, you've kind of made a name for yourself a little bit and you move on from there. But Anna, I she, had, she thought quite a bit about, I won't say too much, but quite a bit about a character that we didn't know did did. She would come out with stuff like, oh, well, so-and-so would do this or so-and-so would do that. It was kind of like, oh, she's thought about this a bit more. I'd be like, Ugh. Well, she's also been playing for three plus years now. So you I know. guess, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's just D&D. I've played yeah. for three minutes. Uh, <laughs> it's about average. No, actually, in 
in D and D World time, I played for three days. I think. Right? Mm -hmm. If you see what I mean. Yeah, like I think three, we did like three sessions. nights. Three sessions. Right, but I think we did three nights. Yeah, that's all I've done so far. Yep. But I got it. Slurp E E wants to know. Uh, what non-combat situation are you most excited for your character to play? Uh, for Judge, it's definitely getting off the boat in its capital. We learned a lot in the last session about what the dock situation is like there, how it's run by one of the guilds, and how the city of Capital is broken up into NOLA houses that run it, and then also guilds that run other aspects of it. And they even mentioned things like maybe like a propaganda newspaper and stuff. All that seems super interesting to judge because he has such a high charisma that he can kind of navigate those RP situations a little more fluidly than other characters, I think. You gotta get there, right? Yeah. Yeah, last right time. now we're last somewhere I weird. Saw. I'm not sure when this will go out, but last time I saw... It was all a bit, you went through a maelstrom and old Tommy Schmuck's got silver eyes and he's unconscious. Yeah. yeah. You're in trouble. Things aren't going so hot. <laughs> but we're adventuring. Yes. This next question Dream. comes from Brian Corth, who does seem to have a little bit of a, a bit of a Game of Thrones kind of sound to his name. That's Thrones, F-R-O-N-E-S, right? So I'm going to do it like that. It's, that's Brian Corth. How did you all come up with the retainers, names, backstories, etc.? Uh, so for each of us, our retainers were based on our charisma modifier. So for the commander at the time, I had one. So I really just spent time thinking about who the commander would recruit into the chain, why they would recruit them, that kind of thing, and then made king that way. Uh, Anna had a plus five, so she had a lot more to make. So she can talk about that. Just basically pulled them all out of my ass. Sounds about right. If you read the little sheet that I was given, uh, yeah, there was a lot of garbage on there. Yeah, a lot. So and I hope it. you all love them. That she makes it. Fortunately, it's not on the cards, and she berates me about it constantly. I will Shouldn't have made it. a skinwalker. Putting skinwalkers out of your ass. <laughs> These retainers are just like in your command, right? Like yes and no. They're they're junior officers of the chain. So they're going to go and do their responsibilities for the chain. Right. But it seems to be that it's less like they're under our control directly. But they are options if our characters die. People that we can switch over to because we spent some time on them. We might like them a lot. You know, I know Schmuck, for example, really likes boots. Mm -hmm. um, if Judge dies, I'm not taking over any of my retainers. Oh, you should take over uh, two shoes. No. Why not? Because I have a leather character figured out. I can't understand. She it. should plus, take over two I'm shoes worried. because a paladin would be... I'm also really, well, I'm really worried that Matt's going to kill my retainers. Who's going to kill your retainer? Matt. Oh. The DM. Uh, Chris Franklin wants to know, do your characters have shocking secrets? Yes. Nate Finch would like to know, since the chain was no one's first pick as a campaign, which campaigns did you choose as your first pick? For me, I chose the, it was called the Wards of the Last Emperor. And that was one where we were going to be able to travel like all across the different lands in Matt's world and look for like legendary items or legendary artifacts of some kind and then eventually become like gods. And I was like, that's cool. I want to do that. Because yeah. a lot of our previous campaign at the time had been slogging through the Underdark and it was it got tedious after a while for me. <laughs> and you got to be, and at the end of that campaign, you could be a god. Well, I think it was that, that the the items, the artifacts that you would collect would, were just so powerful. And in fact, I think we didn't choose that path. Like we cho like eventually it was decided that we were going to do the Iron Tower, <coughs> uh, which is the chain now. And so as a result of us not having done Wards of the Last Emperor's path, I think that's why Ajax has that jade hand, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Because that was actually one of the legendary artifacts that we could have discovered, but because nobody's out there searching for them, Ajax was able to acquire it. Which was your uh, first I choice? I actually picked the same one, so I don't know if it's worth. I mean, I guess I can say, I can say, I can say my piece on it. And it's interesting it, you both picked the same one. <clears throat> so that no, was we two. Like never agree. So that That's was two. Fair. Two of you picked one, and then I, so I assume the other three players in the game all picked different ones. Uh, they yeah, the Iron Tower was most people's second choice. But because it was kind of a ranked choice voting sort of thing, but um, oh, I was saying because I thought if you because if you two both vote for one and these these two these three pick one each, you should have won, mm -hmm. right? First past the post. Well, we're not the DM. No, that's yeah. true. Uh, I picked Wards of the Last Emperor because uh, Matt has a lot of different unique settings in his world, and that whole plot line was about going to those different settings, finding these hidden artifacts, and collecting them to defeat hopefully Ajax in that as well. And that just seemed really cool because there's a lot of cool set pieces there. 
And at the time, you hadn't you hadn't read Black Company yet, because I don't think I had read it either. I had not. I was actually really turned off by the whole in the city thing, because the only reference I had to uh, RPG in a city was Dragon Age 2, which I didn't enjoy. Obviously, it's a video game, not an RPG. But after going through the first three Black Company books, uh, this would have been much higher on the list. Black Company? Uh so Black Company is the book by Glenn Cook uh, that a lot of this campaign t- takes inspiration from for Matt. Like, I think it's one of Matt's favorite book series. And he gave it actually out to, I think, all the players, uh, the trilogy for us to read through. So we kind of understood what we were getting ourselves into. Now I know. Sierra Rocks. Sierra Rocks would like to know. It seems strange that a devotee of Asmodeus would run around with a fairly good group like this. What drew Judge to the chain? Um, well, I don't think that the chain is particularly good or evil. They're just a mercenary company. They just take contracts from whoever it is that needs something done. Kind of evil. They do anything for money, right? Well, there's a line, I think. I think as a group, there's probably a line that as a whole, they'll kind of call before. Like, we wouldn't work for Ajax, for example. Like, well, and that might be because we know that if we were to take up that one works offer to work for Ajax, that he was going to slaughter all of us. And we're like, nah, no thanks. Right, and he'd just eaten your mate earlier, isn't he? Well, that was Relk. Rel- then whenever we got onto the boat uh, on the last session, there was a orc or a half-orc captain there. And he was uh, trying to negotiate with us and trying to encourage us to have the chain join Ajax's right. legions. And that we'd all be treated very well, except for obviously like the captains and uh, all the senior officers would be <laughs> probably ex- uh, executed. It was a trick. You think it was a trick? I don't think it was a trick. I just don't think it wasn't, it didn't seem like it was in our best interest at the time to join Ajax. And I think a lot of us have a lot of good reasons at that point not to join him. That could have been a massive diversion though, right? Right there, you could have just gone. wanted to do it. Yeah. I wanted to see what Matt would do. It's like the bit in... Uh... Empire Strikes Back, right? Where Vader's like this. He's like, join me. Together we can rule the galaxy as right. father and son. And always, I've always thought, if I was Luke Skywalker in that situation, I was like, fucking hell, yeah, all right then. Who's going to stop us two? Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. I learned a lot about you. Just right. Now. I'd like a shot I would have been there. Yeah, and before you Come finish on, just... Dad. Let's go and fuck it up. <laughs> a whole different series. Right, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Ruling. We Big crown. Kylo Ren. Kick the Emperor out. Here we go. Done. Fair enough. Uh, as far as for like what, like why, why would Judge join the chain? Uh, he was definitely in a pretty hot spot in Alloy whenever uh, that that city got sacked, and the chain happened to be there, and he basically just followed them on the way out. City got what sacked? Did you say mm-hmm. like ransacked? Yeah, it, it was invaded and uh, taken is, over. Is this backstory stuff or stuff that they've already we, revealed? We've kind of chatted a little bit about it. Like we've chatted about the fact that the chain was in Alloy at some point in service to the lady. Um, I think she's a little, the Lady of Brass. Uh, but they were in service to her, and they went with her across multiple different planes on different campaigns, essentially, uh, before they came back to Alloy, and that's whenever they realized that the Asia and some other folks had essentially invaded the city, mm. and they were destroying everything and, like, putting everything under, like, this dictatorship. So they um, had to get out. So, yeah, the chain basically saw it as a losing situation, and they are like, all right, we got to get the fuck out of here. And uh, Judge had his own shit happening at the same time. And then uh, a lot of the tiefling population in Alloy, which was um, a big portion of it, they were fleeing, and they actually had fled to Capital, which I maybe we'll get to see some of that. I'm not sure. Uh, hopefully we can, because I think it would be super cool for Judge to meet up with some other tieflings. Um, but Judge kind of saw, you know, joining up with the chain as his ticket to get out of town. Some of Anna's answers were so, so long, I almost fell asleep, but to keep myself awake, I just went out and got a quick haircut. Thanks all for watching the first episode of Chain Reaction, and I hope to see you again soon.